live. We are we are live. I feel like the old NFL show when they would say, "You are looking live." We are live. Hello. It's telling me your connection is a little slow. Like, yes, I know that. All right, Holy Spirit Parish, we got to up the game a little bit. So anyway, just real quick before I forget, I am very very excited to announce our Lenten mission, and so I want to encourage you uh, to attend the mission. March 18th and 19th, we have a personal friend of Father Christopher and Father Francis, both of their Franciscan order, uh, they all three of them together. Father Michael Langlois, who is a priest in Louisiana, I believe the Diocese of Shreveport, I believe, I think it's Shreveport. There's like six dioceses in Louisiana, so I, I think it's Shreveport. <laughs> oh, Okay. You know him. Oh, my land. What a small world. I've been watching some of his stuff. Is He is filled with the fire of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Is that? Amazing. What a small world. Well, anyway, I talked to him on the phone. Man, I just was like, I want to just, I can't wait to meet you. I can't wait to have lunch with you. And he's just, he was so um, full of life and excited. You would think that um, he was doing me the favor. You know? <laughs> I mean, that's how uh, just excited he was to come. And obviously, I'm sure he's excited to spend some time with his friends. And But um, the topic, the topic, out of touch with Jesus, question mark. Come, let us reason together. Isaiah 1. So the theme is basically going to be something along the lines of feeling, if you feel disconnected from the Lord. And from what we talked about, you know, this could be even for people who are going to Mass on a regular basis, and they're praying the rosary, but they feel like something's missing. They're not sure what it is, what's happening. So this is for everybody. So it's not just for somebody who's like, well, I go to mass occasionally, you know, uh, I, I, I may pray uh, occasionally. Yes, it's for them. Hey, what, you know, what's, what's with that? Let's, let's think about that. Let's work on that. But it's also for that person who feels kind of out of touch. Like I'm, I'm doing the things that everybody tells me I need to do, but I'm just missing something. Well, what is it? So that's going to be the theme. So I beg you, invite a friend. Invite a friend and and encourage them to come. So that's on the uh, 18th, 19th of March. Yes, with the pen and service. Yes, with the pen and service on March 20th. He will not be here for the pen and service because he has pastoral responsibilities. And look, we've got verification that he's rock solid. Of course, he's not better than Father Francis and Father Christopher. I mean, that's come on. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so March. Yes, yes. Can't wait to see him. Can't wait to see him. Saw him. Uh, saw the, some of the posts and pictures that he sent, and he looks like he's having a blast. So, all right. So Romans chapter eleven, and we are going to read from seventeen down to thirty-six. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, a wild olive shoot, were grafted in their place to share the richness of the olive tree, do not boast over the branches. If you do boast, remember it is not you that support the root, but the root that supports you. You will say branches were broken off so that it, I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast only through faith. So do not become proud, but stand in awe. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even the others, if they do not persist in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you have been cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these natural branches be grafted back into their own olive tree? 
Lest you be wise in your own conceits, I want you to understand this mystery, brethren. A hardening has come upon part of Israel until the full number of the Gentiles come in, and so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience. So they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may receive mercy. For God has consigned all men to disobedience, that he may have mercy upon all. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I love that section. I love that that last little bit of it. So, here we go, right? Uh, Thinking about last week when we saw Paul introducing this argument, talking about the lump, the branches, and the dough, and now, you know, how he's mixing his metaphors, as they say. C.S. Lewis would say Paul sometimes uh, wasn't a, a very good grammarian, right? He'd mix his metaphors. Paul uses the metaphor of dough and a tree to make the point that if the starting point is holy, then the whole of it shares in that holiness. This is kind of an argument he makes in 1 Corinthians when he talks about a believing spouse and an unbelieving spouse. And he says, look, by the virtue of your baptism, by the virtue of you being washed clean in some way, what happens to your unbelieving spouse it's not in and of itself that they are now holy, but by their connection, there's a, there's a holiness that can permeate and cause them to have a, a, an encounter with the Lord, right? Same idea, right? So this idea of the fact that he's got this argument that he's making is that where did we come from? We came from Israel, not the other way around. And here's the risk, right? One of my favorite writers on, on the book of Romans, I have the commentary in my car. It's massive commentary uh, by a man, N.T. Wright. And I don't know if Han gets into that, Janet, in the, in the, in the study there. But one of the things that's the backdrop of, of the letter, and it's really important, it, it, it lies in the backdrop, okay, is in about 49 A.D., the emperor Claudius had enough of the Jewish squabbles, because think of the Romans, right? They don't know anything about this Jewish Christian stuff, and and they're not getting involved in that, right? We even see that with Pilate at the time of Jesus. Like, what do I know about your law? Why are you coming to me, right? He's wanting to pass it off. You got a law, you deal with it. You got a court, you deal with it, right? Well, they wanted to crucify him, so they had no authority to crucify him. That's why they wanted to go to Pilate. But Pilate's world, just leave me alone. I want to go to bed, all right? Give me some grapes and I'm going to bed. Well, in 49 AD, you know, you've got these Christians, right, who are Jewish. And what was Paul's custom, right? What's the first thing you, I go to the synagogue, time to read. Paul would get up and read. And next thing you know, last year when we did the book of Acts, remember Teresa? Every week there was a fight breaking out, right? Paul was Dana White before Dana White's the UFC guy. Paul was, you know, UFC before there was UFC. There was a fight breaking out everywhere. It was like, whoa, he's in Thessalonica. There's a fight breaking out. They're not happy. So what would happen is in Rome, these squabbles would break out. There are these dissensions. Well, it's bad enough this happens in Corinth. It's bad enough it happens in Ephesus. It's bad enough it happens at Thessalonica. But it ain't going to happen in the backyard of the empire. It ain't going to happen in the backyard where Caesar sits, right? So Claudius in about 49 AD, and we get this from the book of Acts, 
Luke actually tells us this. What did he do? We learned this in our Roman history, right? Get get him out. You go by, toodaloo, get out, and leave, right? And in his mind, they're all Jews. They're, they're Jews, Christians. He doesn't know any of that. He's not getting involved and in like, well, we're arguing about Jesus. Get out. When you can't get along, get out. And so there was an expulsion of the Jewish people. Well, after he dies, what happens? Well, the edict of the prior emperor, as Wright points out, null and void. Well, under Nero, ironically enough, what begins to happen? There, there's a return. There's a return back to Rome. And so you have a situation where Paul is dealing with this now where you have in the church these Gentiles, genuine Gentile believers. Well, they had been without their Jewish brethren for a little while because all the Jews got expelled, whether they were Jewish-Jewish or Jewish-Christian. Gets confusing, right? But you, you know the idea, right? So the Jewish Christian, well, hey, you can't be here. Well, the Gentiles kind of have a little bit of run of the church. Now, with the Jewish Christians coming back, they're now going to interact with each other again. That's the backdrop here. Janet, this, is there any mention of that there in talking about Romans 11? Did I talk a little bit about some of that? Um, what, what, um, kind of what verse? Um, uh, let me see. Where 28. He's talking about they're your enemies. Enemies temporarily until their salvation, beloved. God will never revolt his promise to Israel right. on account of the patriarchs, but loves his people with an everlasting love. That's I, I can't recall if in the in Scott, Scott Hahn's actual commentary if he addresses that, but that's that's lurking in the background. And so Paul, as a pastor, what's one of his jobs? Bring unity, bring peace. And so there's these there's these dissensions, which what what we're going to see it. We're going to see it in a couple of weeks. You know, they're arguing about vegetables and what food to eat. Again, we have to step into their mind. That's just not. Could you imagine? I'm leaving Holy Spirit. Why? Kay made broccoli at the potluck the other day, and that's just right. What? Well, in that world. You have the meat rituals, you have this, you know, you go to, you know, you don't go to the local market and buy your, your local market, you know, they bought it from the idol shop that just offered it to, you know, this God and goddess, right? Again, that's the background of Corinthians, for example, right? And you have, right, you have the different, right? So, you know, you try to navigate this. This is not easy, right? And so some of the Gentiles might have been taking a little bit of the attitude of what food laws? That's stupid. And, of course, this is offensive, right? Like Paul does not navigate things that way. He, he, he kind of like, hey, listen, if you're the stronger brother, deny yourself your right. If it's, you know, it, yeah, I know you could have pork barbecue, right? But your neighbor is having a hard time seeing you eat that pork barbecue and it's upsetting his faith. Be the bigger Christian about it. You know, deny your right in that moment, right? That's basically what Paul's, and we'll get to that in a second, but that's the backdrop of some of what's going on here. So here's the deal. Um, this idea is expressed by Jesus in the Gospels, for example. The rich root of the olive tree is a reference to Israel's Messiah, and that's N.T. Wright, where I, I referenced that in, that in that commentary, okay? So it's a rich root. So we need to be engrafted into what the olive tree right and again you think of john's gospel i am the vine and you are the branches very similar line of thinking here paul's point and this is key paul's point is to emphasize that the gentiles have been brought in <laughs> and he gets a little jab in despite being what wild olive branches All right you were out there living a life of debauchery. Don't play any game. You weren't sitting around going, hey, look at us. Save us, God. Uh -uh. You were found by a people that was not seeking you, right? That's what God says, right? <laughs> I've been found by a people 
that was not seeking me, right? In other words, the Gentiles, which we see Christmas season, Epiphany and all that. By the way, bring your candles on Friday. Candles on Friday, piece of the presentation. So I think Father's going to be blessing a bunch of candles. So Paul's point is to emphasize that the Gentiles have been brought in, despite being wild olive branches, to share in the very life of the olive tree, which stands for the people of God. The rich root of the tree gives life to the tree and the branches. Just as Paul, excluding boasting on the part of the Jewish people, think back to Romans 3, so now he also excludes the boasting of the Gentiles. If there is to be any boast, then the boast is to be in the root, namely Christ, Galatians 6, where Paul says very clearly, my boast is in who? Christ. And that's what he's emphasizing to them. And so, again, important to keep in mind, which I'll bring up a little bit later, this letter is a continuous letter. You know, we started reading this back in, well, the end of August. We're now, well, approaching February. That didn't take them that long to read Romans when they first read it. You know, it was a 40-minute reading of the, of the letter, right? Boom, they're going to read it in church, and this is it. And, this is what they, and, and so they're not having to go, hey, remember four months ago when we talked about, right? No, they're not doing that. It, it's one continuous line of thought. And so it's, it, you know, it, it, it's going to be read in the church. Paul's line of argument continues this way from verses 20 to 27, okay? That is true, right? Branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast only through faith. So do not become proud, but stand in awe. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Right? Isn't this always the tension of faith? Right? It's always that struggle. Who is God? Right? Can there be a way in which maybe we're a little too cavalier in how we approach it? Is that a possibility? Could we... I had lunch today. Father Dean uh, was there. A couple of us got, got together. And, you know, we talk about these things, but... You know, one of the things that Father Dean always would say, you know, I, I remember when he was out at Queen of Mercy, he said, you know, he, he, want, he once preached a sermon and he said, look, he says, I want to be the best priest that I can be. But one thing I know is I'm not nearly as good as I think the data might suggest. And everybody's like, whoa, what's he going to talk about? He's like, well, well, my job as a priest to help my people get to heaven and help them to become holy. So. Every Saturday, I come in this church, and I open the church doors at about 2.30 in the afternoon. And then at about 2.45, 2.50, I head on back into the confessional, and I wait. And I wait. And I wait. And he says, but then I celebrate Mass. And the communion line, well, it's really long. So I must have the holiest congregation. Ever, because my confession lines are really, really short, but my communion lines are really, really long. And of course, everybody's just like, and he, and then he proceeded to preach a sermon on the presumptuousness of sin, and Psalm 19, where the psalmist says, "Lord, keep thy servant from presumptuous sins." And we, in the Catechism, as Catholics, we talk about the sin of presumption. Right? There's the sin of despair, but there's also the sin of presumption. Right? Sin of despair is a grave sin. Don't no. Don't despair of God's mercy. He loves you more than you love yourself. But don't presume upon it either. Don't be like, you owe this to me, God. You, you, you have to do this for me. Because why wouldn't you? Because what's not to love about me? Look how great I am. Well, that, that's a bad place to be in. That's kind of what Paul's saying here to the Gentiles. Don't don't boast. Don't act like, oh, they've been rejected. They're bad. We've been accepted. We're good. No, you were a wild olive branch. Don't forget that. And there is a grace, isn't there? In I remember 
pray, and I and I and I do pray, and it helps me with my high schoolers. And I always say this: the greatest gift that God has given me, other than my marriage and my my family, my immediate, is the work I get to do every day working with a bunch of teenagers, because they keep me honest, they make me want to be a better person, they make me want to live my faith, because I know they're watching, and they're not just watching at that school; they're watching here when I see them and they, where they work. I see how many of my students at jobs, you know, places of business. My wife, you know, has had surgery over at Baptist East and, you know, some of her nurses were students of mine, you know, former students of mine, right? So people are, are watching and, and, and I, I love that. I love that challenge. But it also is important for me to remember that I was once their age and that if you had said to the 17 year old Tom, that when he was 54, that the delight of his day would be to go to mass and to spend time in the chapel and to th think about and talk about the things of God, I would have thought you were nuts. And yet, here we are. I wouldn't have it any other way. And so when they do something dopey, and invariably they will, it's very easy for me. It really isn't hard. It's very easy for me to be compassionate to them and also to be stern. It's not, it's not that complicated because it's, it's one of these things where, you know, being a part of their life, you know, like they're going to make mistakes because we were once that age too. And we do things that, you know, maybe we regret. And I've asked God, Lord, always remind me of the fact that I, too, am a sinner, that I'm no better than them. And it does an amazing job, I think, of being able to deal with people. Because I think a lot of times, Father Carucci once said that. He said, you know, I have found that people who don't really have faith, they're really, in many ways, some of the most judgmental people. You know, a lot of times people think it's we Christians. I just think that's just a load of hooey to be honest with you. I really do. And if I wasn't on YouTube, I might have said something else. I don't know. That's just a load of rubbish. Right? I love that word, rubbish. Um, and he said, Father Cucci said this, and I thought it was very wise. He said, you know, my experience is that typically people who really don't believe, they tend to be most judgmental because they haven't tasted of God's forgiveness. They haven't really known what it's like to be forgiven. They might be outwardly religious. They might go to church. They might go to Bible study, but they really haven't tasted of God's forgiveness. Because when you've tasted God's forgiveness, then you're wanting to share that with other people. And I thought, man, that's really good insight. Have you thought some of the same things that maybe some of the non-church going people maybe had a little bit more judgmental uh, qualities about them than, than uh, people think? And, and, and we Christians probably get beat up a little bit too much for it. Because I haven't found, I mean, honestly, I haven't found a judgmental Catholic community here at all. I, I haven't. I haven't found a judgmental Montgomery Catholic school community. I, I haven't found it. I'll hear people say these things. Oh, I went to confession once and Father told me to get out. And I'm like, oh, I've, I've never met that priest. I've never met that priest that everybody seems to, oh, oh I was a priest at this. I've never met him. I've never seen anything but compassion. And knowing so many priests that I, that I know, Short of offering the holy sacrifice of the Mass, there's no greater joy for them than put on that stolen and hear confessions. They love, they love to do that. Father McKenna lived for the confessional. He loved it. He was tough, but he loved it. Hasn't that been your experience? You know. So. I think that knowing Jesus and his mercy and, and grace for us. As Christians, you know, I think we tend to have the thought that, hey, to get mercy, you got to show mercy. Right. And right. So we have that inspiration as non-believers. They don't have that same inspiration. Right. So, um, and here and actually quote the catechism on presumption, right? Um St. Augustine, what's the key to the Christian life? It's like real estate, location, location, location. 
Humility, 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 right? What's the key? The first step in the spiritual life, humility. The second step in the spiritual life, humility. The third step in the spiritual life, humility. Paul says that this should move us toward reverence and awe for the work of God. Paul issues forth a warning against presumption. And here I quote the catechism directly from 2092. There are two kinds of presumption. Either man presumes upon his own capacities, hoping to be able to save himself without help from on high, or he presumes upon God's almighty power or his mercy, hoping to obtain his forgiveness without conversion and glory without merit. So it's kind of a Christ-less conversion, right? That's kind of what's going on there. Flannery O'Connor's novel, Wise Blood, Hazel Motes, he is the preacher, and he wants to preach the gospel of the Church of Christ without Christ. Bishop Barron's a huge uh, Flannery fan. He loves Flannery O'Connor, our neighbor, neighbor to the, to the east of us. A hillbilly Thomas, that's what she called herself. She was a hillbilly Thomist. They had said, your stories, they read like a hillbilly nihilist. And she said, no, I prefer to think of myself as a hillbilly Thomist. That's what she said. So um, I love that definition, right? Because it really does capture, right? So on the one hand, it could be, I can save myself. What we call Pelagian thought. Pelagius was an early heretic. St. Augustine fought against him, right? The importance of grace, the essential nature of grace. We need grace. Without grace, we can't be saved, right? Pelagius said, no, we don't need that. We can do it on our own. That's presumption, right? Somehow I have my innate abilities on my own to make the path, to follow God, to do it on my own, to do the things that I need to do without any help from above, as it says. Or, on the other hand, it's this idea that I don't have to have a change of heart. I don't have to change the way I think. I don't have to change the way I act. I'm going to keep living the way I live. I, You know, I'm... I got saved when I was seven. Everything's fine. Everything's good. Whatever it might be, right? I got, from a Catholic perspective, well, I got the papers. I got baptized. Everything's fine. Haven't been to church in 30 years. Doesn't matter. I'm good, right? Things like that. So we have to be very careful of those two types of presumption. Anybody have thoughts, comments, observations about that? You know, I used to tell uh, the RCIA class at Maxwell when uh, Greg and I were doing it. And uh, I was saying, you know, the set of presumption is like the student in the class who takes his pencil and bites off the eraser. <laughs> you have the set of presumption. I like that. I like that. That's a good one. A good example that was just brought up was the fact that um, the sin of presumption is like a, a child who has in school has a pencil with the eraser and bites off the eraser. Not going to need the eraser anymore. I don't know about that. You're going to probably need it. I've seen some of your handwriting. Okay. So anyway, penmanship. We need to go back to penmanship. Okay. So, All right. So here's Paul. Notice how he talks about the kindness and severity of God. God is severe towards those who have fallen. In other words, those that have rejected him. He gives them what they want. Think back to Romans 1. What does God do to those who reject him? He hands them over. All right, that's what you want. Have at it, kids. There you go. Play in the mud that you have made. You have turned from me. You have rejected me. Here you go. Right? Yet, he is kind toward those who follow him and trust him. It has rightly been said of our Lord he comforted the uncomfortable and made uncomfortable the comforted. Those who were secure in their place, I'm fine, everything's good. He kind of came in and rocked the boat a little bit. To those who felt marginalized, just yesterday, the morning, uh, yesterday morning at Mass, daily Mass, you know, we have the story of the woman 
who had the issue of blood, who had been hemorrhaging. If only I could just touch his garment, right? She felt so marginalized. She had no home. She was shamed, at wit's end, helpless, overwhelmed. She lost everything, try, trying to have healing in her life, right? And it's a beautiful, tender story because when she does touch, Jesus says, who touched me? And she's, she's embarrassed. She's, she's like, oh, no. And what does Jesus do? He says, woman, your faith has saved you. Wow, what a beautiful story. He brought her comfort. He brought her comfort, right? Um, and in many ways, that's, that's what it's all about, right? If you feel like you are so far from God that he wants nothing to do with you, know that he comforts the brokenhearted. I, I, I've shared this story before. I'll never forget it. It'll, it'll stay with me, I'm sure, until I pass from this world. Uh, it's about eight, is it, yeah, it's gone on 18 years. It was just before I moved here. So it was the spring, early spring of 06. And uh, a coworker of mine, uh, when I went in the interval of leaving the Presbyterian ministry and eventually coming to Mobile and working for the church, I was doing some former work that I had done, a little bit of marketing, things like that. And so my boss had said to me, he said, can we talk? And I said, sure, what's up? It was late. We had just got done working in a grocery store. We did a whole reset in the store, made the store look pretty. It was kind of a remodel, re-grand opening. And he was about my age, so now he's probably about 54 or so, but we're about the same age. So it was like in our mid-30s. And he said, can we talk? I said, sure. And he said, um, does God forgive sin? And I thought he was putting me on. Like, maybe I'm a holy roller and he's kind of making fun of me. Like, you know what I mean? I don't, I don't know. And, and I said to him, I said, I laughed. And I said, uh, of course he does. Like that. And he grabbed me and he pulled me and he pulled me close. And he, he got red and tears started coming down his face. And he said, no, Tom, does God forgive sin? He never got into what had happened or what it was. Heaven only knows. I don't even want to speculate. But the, the sense that I got was something in his life that he felt responsible before was utterly weighing on him to the point that maybe he felt like he could never find forgiveness. He didn't tell me. I didn't ask. I, he, was, he was Catholic. Like a lot of Northerners, though, his faith relationship with the church was not very vital. But I did encourage him. I said, look, I, don't, I won't say his name, but look, go to a priest. Go talk to the priest. Whatever's weighing on you. Yes. And I, I, I went in and I, I said, yes, God does forgive sin. And I, I read to him the story <laughs> of David and David and Uriah and, and Bathsheba. And yet here was this man, Psalm 51. You know, look, here was a man who was an adulterer and a murderer. And yet God says in his own word, he was a man after his own heart. And of course, the famous phrase that we've all heard, right, attributed to many, every what? Every saint had a past and every sinner has a future. There it is. Thank God for that. Amen. Thank God for that. Um, so anyway, uh, he dealt with the repentant sinners with great compassion and kindness. And those who persisted in their opposition to him, he rebuked and challenged. So verses 25 to 26, Paul, in order to keep the Gentiles from becoming wise in the conceitedness, uses mystery. Mystery keeps us humble and makes us realize that we do not know as much as we think we do. I've said before, and I'll say it to my dying day, the more I study theology, the more I study who God is, the more I realize how little I know theology and how little I know who God is. And that makes me want to know him more. That was St. Thomas Aquinas, right? He never had enough. There was always more. I want to know you, Lord. I want more of you, Lord. Lord, keep... Can you show yourself to me today? Right? There's a constant desire. Mystery keeps us humble 
And Paul uses this term to discuss the mystery of Israel's rejection of the Messiah, which we've been talking about. Isn't this the quandary? Wait, your Messiah came and most are not accepting him. What's going on here, right? What's happened here, right? So Paul's trying to deal with this question. Remember back, Romans 2 and 3, he addresses these questions, which he's now coming back later, coming back around. 9, he addressed this. What then Israel? Why Israel? Right? Oh, they received the oracles of God. Then he moves on to something else. But now he comes back and he dealt with that in Romans 9. I attest you, brethren, right? There's the covenants. There's, you know, Christ who is God over all, right? He's, he's making this point to say, no, God has not forgotten his people. Last week, he's like, hey, what? I'm, I'm a Jew. God hasn't forgotten me, right? Because you can take Paul's language and so twist it, as 2 Peter chapter 3 warns us, that it makes it sound like he's saying God's done with the Jewish people, right? But he says, no, that's, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that there is a time of hardening here, absolutely, in Israel's rejection of the Messiah, but it's not happened without a divine plan, which is until the full number of the Gentiles comes in. Until the full number of the Gentiles comes in. So that is what he is saying, right? So that is why he is saying, lest you be wise in your own conceits, I want you to understand this mystery, brethren. A hardening has come upon part of Israel until the full number of the Gentiles come in. Verse 26, and so all Israel will be saved. So for Paul, is there two Israels? There's only one. And who is Israel? Israel is made up of both Jew and Gentile. There's not two peoples of God. Paul doesn't want that. The whole point of Christ, he says in, in, in Ephesians 2, is to say what? By his death on the cross, what did he do? He broke down the dividing wall. Remember that? And so out of one man, Jesus, he made what? One people out of two. Jews and Gentiles. If we say there's two people of God, what are we doing? We're going backwards, aren't we? We're going back to the old covenant. And I know we have to be careful, and I'm saying this on YouTube, so maybe I got to be careful too. But the fact is, the fact is, while we can look at things from a geopolitical perspective and talk about Israel as a nation state, but from a theological perspective, that's a different thing than what Paul's saying here. And we have to realize that, which is. You know, Bishop Barron just did an interview with Ben Shapiro again, where he's talking about the, and he does it very, very uh, uh, winsomely, all right? But he's showing how um, Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism, right? John Paul II says the same thing. John Paul II says Christians are spiritual Semites. We are related to the Jewish people. But what John Paul does not say is that there's two peoples of God. There's, there's the people of God in Jesus Christ and all people everywhere are invited to share in that reality. And how God brings that about is up to God. God will figure that out. But the church herself made up of Jew and Gentile. Because again, we forget. that We think of the church as a Gentile thing, but if you were in the early church, would you have thought that? No, because there were as many what? In the the early church. In fact, they were Jewish. Right? All the leaders of the early church were Jewish. We can't forget that. That's a reality. So it's important to keep that in mind. So Paul is saying, look, you know, this is perplexing. Paul is not necessarily referring to a complete number of Gentiles in a mathematical sense, though he could possibly be. Wright thinks this refers to the gospel message going to the ends of the earth. I think that's plausible. I'm not, I'm not sure if I agree with that, but I, it's plausible. You know, the fact that the gospel has made it to the ends of the earth, and when that happens, then all these other things are going to take place. 
So who does this refer to? Following right, here are the options that are the most, well, likely options, right? There's really, these are the only options really when you think about it. So N.T. Wright, again, make it very clear. I'm just borrowing his ideas, things I've thought about, but he says it so much better than I ever could. A, all Israel refers to Jews and Gentiles. B, all Israel is the elect of the nation of Israel. In other words, just Jewish, Jewish people who become believers. C, all Israel is the whole nation of Israel. When will this happen? A, so the answer to A, during present history, which is what I would say. I, I know we have it. I know we have it, but somebody may have borrowed it because I've mentioned it. I, RCIA, I've mentioned it as well. So there's a book in our library that we have by a man named Roy Shoman. Has anybody heard of Roy Shoman? Roy Shoman wrote a book called Salvation is from the Jews, from John chapter 4. With Jesus at the well of Samaria with the woman. And so he took the title from there when Jesus said, Salvation is of the Jews. Well, this book is basically Roy Shoman, who grew up Jewish, but became a Catholic. And so he goes through the book to show how, as a Jew, Catholicism made sense of his Judaism. There's another group, a woman by the name of Rosalind Moss, who is now Sister Miriam, and her brother, and I can't remember his first name, driving going to drive me crazy. Uh, but anyway, um, Ma, obviously Moss, because Rosalind had never married, so she, she had the same last name. But there's an organization, and you can go online now, and it is a great website. It might be one of the best websites out there. I love it. It's called Hebrew Catholics. It's a Hebrew Catholic website. And people like Roy Shoman and the Mosses and, um, oh, just drew a blank. Oh, La Lawrence Feingold. Lawrence Feingold is a Jewish convert who is one of the probably top five theologians in the American church. He's a professor at Kenrick Lennon Seminary in St. Louis. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. But Jewish, like bar mitzvah, circumcision, kosher, and he's Catholic. And he does not see himself in becoming Catholic as repudiating his past. He sees it as the fulfillment of all these feasts that he heard about growing up. Like we talked the other day, right, in, in Sunday morning, Janet, about the Exodus and the Day of Atonement. And when you look at the cross of Jesus, you go, oh my, this makes so much sense of what happened to Jesus. And so there you go. Um, you can go check out that website. And like I said, you'll have articles and lectures and talks. So we would say the traditional understanding is A. The tradition. So St. Augustine would have believed A, okay? That right now, around the world, unbeknownst to you and me, Jewish people are becoming Christian and they're becoming Catholic. There's not a lot of fanfare about it. There's no press release about it. But it's happening. And people like Roy Shoman. In fact, another book that Roy Shoman has, he published, is the conversion stories of about 20 Jewish believers to Catholicism that go back 300 years. And the title of that book is called Honey from the Rock. Honey from the Rock. And you know how Journey Home publishes these conversions of Presbyterian and Methodist ministers and so on? Well, this book is basically just a collection of Jewish men and women who became Catholic. And it's awesome. And it gets into their psyche and what they went through and how they pro. Now, listen, if you think 
somebody coming from the Baptist church is going to have a hard time becoming Catholic. Could you imagine what somebody coming from the Jewish synagogue is going to experience? In many cases, this is this is a funeral, right? Tevia and Fiddler on the Roof, right? I don't have a daughter. My daughter is dead. Papa, Papa, remember that haunting scene? I don't have a daughter. My daughter is dead. And he he tears the clothing and she screams, right? Because that's the funeral act, right? You tear the clothing, right? So, so all Israel now in present history is being saved amongst Jews and Gentiles. B, this one, the elect, right? The elect nation of Israel, the, those that are elect within Israel, that's going to happen immediately before the second coming. That's that's that idea. And C, in the moment of the second coming. So if you've ever read the or heard about the Left Behind books, huge, remember hugely popular 20 years ago? B and C are kind of the theology of the Left Behind books. If you've heard of the rapture, okay, so what, one day, here's what's going to happen. According to... We don't believe this. I don't believe in the rapture. Okay, but here's the deal. I don't want anybody reporting me to Archbishop Brody. This is very dangerous what I'm doing right now. YouTube, don't report me to Archbishop Brody. So anyway, um, we're going to, we're going to work one day. And all of a sudden, these people known as Christians are gone. <laughs> so cars are unmanned on the you're going on. How great would that be on the Cross Bronx Expressway? Stuck in traffic for three hours. You left out the trumpet. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So all of a sudden, and all these cars are left unmanned on the Cross Bronx. Well, it's New York, so maybe a lot of cars won't be unmanned. I don't know. So anyway, all true believers are going to be lifted up and raptured up. And there's going to be a special report. One billion people are no longer here on earth, right? Well, left behind, left behind, that's the title, right? Are all the non-believers, including the Jewish non-believers in Jesus. Well, then eventually what's going to happen is now God in that time is now that's when he's going to start working with Israel. Does that make sense? Now he's going to bring Israel back. They're going to go, they're going to wind up in Jerusalem. There's, there's all this stuff. And then there's going to be this tribulation period. And then it gets, it, it. you almost have to have a map to try to figure it out, right? And sometimes there used to be a guy on TV, his name, Jack Van Impey. If you ever heard that name, the morning stuff. You ever, and he'd have like this. Now, this fulfills Daniel 917. Okay, this is over here. Now the New York Times was reporting the other day, and this is going to fulfill Daniel 11:5, right? And and you're going, man, this is really good. How does he do all this stuff? Right? Little did you know he probably had some earpiece or something like that. I don't know. But I don't know. He probably didn't have an ear. He probably knew all that stuff. But anyway, they're charting it out. That's where that comes from. Traditional Christian thinking, though. You were Methodist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Baptist. Up until the 18th century, nobody ever taught any of this stuff. I mean, this is, this is basically new theology. Like, you, you have some parts of it in the early church about the tribulation stuff, but not, none of this elaborate, you're driving along one day or you're on horseback. You know, St. Irenaeus is not writing... You're going to be on horseback one day, and next thing you know, God's going to take you from from the world, and 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 you're and all these people are going to be left behind, and all that kind of stuff. Nobody's that does not happen until a man named Darby in the 1800s, and then another guy picks it up named C.I. Schofield. Schofield publishes a study Bible, and it takes off. And next thing you know, 20th century America at the very beginning is wrought with this rapture left behind stuff. Almost all Protestant seminaries start teaching it. That's why it becomes so popular. It's kind of losing favor today. So, did any of you had heard of the rapture and stuff like that? Okay, that's Tim that's. LaHaye. But was it Tom LaHaye? Was Tim LaHaye, right? He was another one. Right. 
So anyway, what are the best answers to each question? A, A, and A. <laughs> That's what I write. So all Israel refers to Jews and Gentiles. It will happen during present history. And it will happen through conversion to the Christian faith. That is the traditional answer. That's the answer Wright states as well that he, that he thinks. And it makes the most sense of Paul's argument. Each makes the best sense exegetically, that's just a fancy word that means when you read it from the text, of the overall passage and the overall context of the letter as a whole. Wouldn't it seem strange that Paul would kind of do an end run around the gospel? I mean, to somehow think that they're going to get saved by some other way kind of defeats the purpose of what he's talking about. And yet there are Christians out there who kind of think some of these ideas are what the Bible teaches. And yet they'll say that we as Catholics don't take the Bible literally. It's weird. You know, it's like, wait, are you, are you really advocating that we're going to return to the temple system? Because you may have heard like the desire to get the temple rebuilt and all that kind of stuff. Like that is, I mean, that is just not part of the Christian tradition. That in order for them to get saved, they need to rebuild the temple? Wait, Jesus called himself the what? He was the temple. Not a temple of brick and mortar. He himself, his body is the temple. What happened when Jesus died on the cross? The temple was right in twain. Wait, you know, so always keep that in mind. Fully conceding, Paul's words here are a little perplexing. Everybody recognizes that. Paul has already redefined Israel with Jesus Christ as the center of what it means to be Israel. And those that are in Christ from both Jew and Gentile constitute this redefined Israel. Paul then conflates two Old Testament passages, Isaiah 59 and Jeremiah 31. The RSV in verse 28 says, enemies of God. Okay? Yikes, not a good translation. So if you're, if, like my translation is the RSV, which I like typically. Ordinarily, it's the best, I think, the best English translation. But always, it's why it's, I recommend to have two to three translations in your repertoire because you will get a fuller picture of what's being written. Because each translator, remember, you have different scholars working on these things. And there's multiple options, just like, you know, last night we're watching Wheel of Fortune. And so my wife, of course, is Puerto Rican and speaks Spanish. And so the name of the show in Spain, okay, is not the Wheel of Fortune um, that we have in English. It's the Wheel of Luck. It's the Wheel of Luck. Even though they have a word for fortune in Spanish, that's not the word they picked for their show in Spain. And I, I said, why is that? She said, because the word luck more communicates what we mean by our word fortune. So it's it's a translator's choice, right? They had an option there. They chose the one that was closer in thought, right? That happens all the time with translation. You could have five different words for the word. Pick one. So enemies of God sounds like like God, like fighting, you know, like fighting and, and all that kind of stuff. Rather the translation better reads what the NAB has. They are enemies for your account. Like for you. That's what I have to do, Wade. Uh, enemies. <clears throat> enemies for your sake. For your sake. Right. God has not made the Jewish people his enemy, though unwittingly many may have made God their enemy. Rather, Paul emphasizes that they are beloved by God. God has not rejected his people, Paul says. It is they that have rejected him. This point about them is true of all people. God loves all and desires the salvation of all. 2 Peter chapter 3, 1 John 2, and 1 Timothy 2. All three passages by three different New Testament writers explicitly state God desires all to be saved. Never think God wills anybody to hell. Sadly, it appears that not all will receive this love. 
Paul then goes on to say that all have been consigned to disobedience. In other words, all people deserve God's judgment, but God offers all his mercy. And then my favorite ending to it. This passage culminates with a great expression of praise for God. As Paul contemplates his line of thought and he considers the plan and work of God, he cannot do anything but express praise and worship. All theology leads to doxology. All theology leads to doxology. It brings us to our knees. And I just love how Paul just, when he, it's like he's kind of, all of a sudden, you know, that person, you're talking to somebody, they say something and they catch themselves and they're like, wow. You know, that's kind of what happens here, where Paul just is taken up in the grandeur and glory of God and what he's saying, what he's talking about. And I think that's something that we should ask God for in our own lives. Lord, let me love you and let me praise you like Paul did. Because Paul was in love with God. And when he thought about God, it kind of carried him away. You know, you say get carried away. Paul got carried away here. He goes from this line, tight, thinking, clear, to, oh, the depths and the riches of God. How unsearchable is his wisdom. Right? You could, you could just see it. Feel it. So, anyway, anybody have thoughts and comments, observations as we wrap it up? Right. Right, exactly. Exactly. It's um, the right way of believing, the right way of worshiping, you know, and, and literally ortho, right, you know. You know, what's interesting is that uh, um, G.K. Chesterton wrote a book with that title, Orthodoxy. Orthodoxy. Before he became a Catholic. Right. Which I find astonishing. Mm -hmm. I mean, absolutely. You read that and you say, why isn't this guy Catholic? Right. I mean, he was ahead of his time. And he held out becoming Catholic for the sake of his wife, who wasn't there. But then eventually he said, I, I can't wait anymore. I've got to do it. You know. What is a permissible Catholic response to our um, fundamentalist brothers and sisters who would argue that all believing or practicing Jews are going to hell because they do not recognize Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Um, I mean, I've often thought about that, and, and in particular, I my thought is, and not, I mean, this might be a, is a very simplistic hypothetical, but you know, if you are a practicing Jew, just like my parents taught me my faith, they have been taught their faith. By their parents or their community and i'm sure in their community there are reasons given why this jesus christ or this jesus of nazareth was not the messiah i'm sure they get that explanation because they live in, a, in surrounded by christians mm -hmm. so as a catholic what would our response be as i mentioned when our fundamentalist brothers and sisters saying no they're going to hell I, that seems rather harsh. Right. I, I'm, my my answer to that would be the, the church would say, look, no matter who it is, right? Think of Lumen Gentium, the, the Second Vatican Council's document on the church, right? It says very clearly that the church is, okay, the vessel of salvation, right? And, and it actually says those who who knowing that the Catholic Church has been instituted by Jesus Christ for salvation and refuse to enter her cannot be saved. Like those who know and refuse cannot be saved. But then it goes on to talk about the relationship with all, it begins with the Jewish people. Well, first it begins with Christian denominations, then the Jewish people, then Muslims, and then other religions in the world. And it makes it very clear 
that if you are saved, let's say somebody is saved and they're not a, they're not they're not explicitly materially a Christian, or, or I mean, they're not formally a Christian. They had and and there there's no explicit witness in their life that they're a Christian. If they were saved without having become explicitly a Christian, if they theoretically saved, they're only saved on account of Christ and the church, right? Because if not, then that means salvation is possible apart from Christ. So the only way anybody could be saved is through the blood of Christ. But what the church is reluctant to say is only God knows. We don't know the totality of that. We don't, only God knows the totality of a person's life. What were the things in play? I take a real life example of a C.S. Lewis, you know, who obviously I know was a Christian, but who knew a lot of stuff, but there were things in his life that prevented him from becoming Catholic. It, it, clearly, uh, anti-Catholicism that was just part and parcel of his culture. And psychologically, he probably had a very hard time breaking away from that. Perfect world, he should have maybe, but we're all works in progress, right? But yeah, John Paul II tells Walter Hooper, who was C.S. Lewis's executor of his estate, that man was an apologist. He did his, he did his job well, right? He enjoyed Lewis. John Paul enjoyed Lewis. John, Benedict XVI did as well. Um, but he's, he would, if you're saved, you're not saved, you're not saved by, because, oh, you were a good fill in the blank. You're saved because of Christ through his church and through the merits of his church. And that I think would be the church's answer to all to all people, regardless of who they are. Does that kind of square with what some of you might think? It, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Which is why the church will only canonize, but will never say this person's in hell. The, the church won't say that. Not because the church doesn't believe that there's a hell, but because we don't know that information. Only God knows the totality of the information. And uh, to continue, pray pray for all, all people. That's why, you know, you, you'll never hear, hey, so you go to a priest and say, I want to have a mass set for so-and-so. Ah, oh, he never was in church. Don't pray for him. You're wasting your time. You'll never have that. We're like, offer, offer the mass. Offer them. Best line I ever had a about that was Father John Tregilio, great Italian name from Pennsylvania, Harrisburg Diocese, on EWTN. What if, you know, we always ask the what if, and so, Father, what if we have a mass said for somebody and they're in hell? And Father John, I heard him give this answer, and I said, this is a great answer. He said, look, no prayer and no mass is ever wasted. And so if theoretically that's a possibility, well, could God not apply the benefits of that mass to another soul that needs it. Of course he could. He could do that, right? We believe that even now that somewhere in the world mass is being offered and somehow we're being benefited by that. Well, he said, could not a soul in purgatory who needs those prayers be benefited by that? He said, nothing's ever wasted. It's all in some way used by God in the economy of salvation. And I love that answer because it's comforting to know it's never wasted. So, all right. We'll close in prayer. Let's close. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Together we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Thank you.